Okay. Mr. Toy, the chairman of the board of the Toronto Blizzard and all these many years in the North American Soccer League, this is the gentleman that brought Pelé to the United States, that brought Franz Bachenbauer to the United States. This is the fellow who really put soccer on its feet here in this country. Clive, uh, congratulations on assuming the duties of chairman of the board of the Toronto Blizzard and congratulations on the position Toronto now has going once again for uh, the, the bowl. Yeah, it's kind of you, uh, Howard. We're obviously delighted that for the second time in a row we're, we're in the Soccer Bowl series. Um, trying to win it this time instead of losing as we did last year to Tulsa in, uh, in Vancouver. Disappointed, even though I'm talking in Comiskey Park, Chicago, disappointed that we're not playing Vancouver in, uh, in Soccer Bowl because there are natural rivals. We've had some pretty hot games with uh, Vancouver. They don't like us in uh, BC and we don't like the Whitecaps too much in Ontario. Uh, so we had been looking forward to having the home game advantage with the Whitecaps, as it is you and uh, the people of the Sting um, messed that uh, idea up by a uh, tremendous victory in, uh, in the semi-finals. Uh, but it is good for us. Um, we think we've built the, the core of a team which is going to stay together for a, for a long, long time. We haven't made many changes over the past year or two. A lot of young players who obviously can only get better under mm -hmm. good coaching. So we're looking forward to this as not only the second soccer ball the Blizzard's in, but the, the second of many more to come. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Hey there, everybody. What's new? How you doing? My name is Tim Hanlon, and this is, of course, Good Seats Still Available, that curious little podcast that is devoted to what used to be in professional sports. I appreciate tremendously your uh, finding us here in the uh, wild and uh, woolly world of podcast land. Uh, we know how hard it is to find uh, quality stuff out there, and we appreciate you finding us, downloading us, and of course, uh, rating and reviewing us and um, uh, subscribing to us, doing whatever you can to uh, uh, listen to and, of course, share uh, and recommend uh, this little show. We appreciate it very much, and uh, we also appreciate you uh, staying tuned for a, uh, a tremendous and wonderful conversation uh, with the legendary Soccer Hall of Famer Clive Toy who you heard there in the uh, intro being introduced uh, in the uh, courtesy of the Wayback Machine uh, back in 1984. That was a clip from, I think it was halftime of the uh, first game, game number one of the uh, 1984 NASL Soccer Bowl. That year, I think was the first year that they uh, decided to uh, make the Soccer Bowl uh, a three-game best of a series versus uh, a one-game uh, winner-take-all uh, all game. Uh, and that, again, it was 1984. And when Clive, uh, as we'll get to in our conversation, uh, was the uh, president, chairman, general manager, chief cook and bottle washer for the Toronto Blizzard uh, of the NASL in its uh, last year. As a matter of fact, the entire league was in its last year. As a matter of fact, that clip wound up uh, being uh, the second to last game ever played uh, in the North American Soccer League. And um you know, there's a lot of sort of uh, uh, consternation and, and uh, question marks uh, circling uh, the North American Soccer League at that time in 1984. Uh, you could probably hear a little bit of it behind the scenes uh, in the, in between the uh, in the words there in that little interview clip. But uh, we're going to get into all of that, uh, of course, and and prior to all of that, uh, just the the actual rise of the league of the North American Soccer League, which Clive was instrumental in. Frankly, uh, you know, uh, besides say somebody like Phil Woosnam, the uh, a long time and former and uh, uh, now deceased uh, commissioner of the North American Soccer League. Uh, there's probably nobody more um, quintessentially uh, relevant uh, and important in the history of that league, the North American Soccer League, uh, than that of Clive Toy. We're going to get into his entire uh, very impressive and uh, 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 story-filled uh, career uh, through uh, the the primordial ooze of the NASL, that being the International Soccer League with a guy named Bill Cox, who we've talked about in a previous uh, episode or two, uh, who uh, ran something called the International Soccer League, which was sort of this uh, international round robin tournament in the United States. Uh, of course, the 1966 uh, World Cup in England uh, fueled even more interest in the sport here uh, in terms of uh, getting some professional leagues going, plural. Uh, there were no sh no fewer than three entities that wanted to get leagues running, and two of them wound up doing so in 1967. Uh, you're going to hear from Clive and his uh, his uh, work with uh, with Bill Cox, as well as 
uh, Mr. Cox's involvement in one of those two leagues, the NPSL, National Professional Soccer League. We've talked about that in a few episodes as well, and how that led to uh, the uh, the NASL, which was sort of the repository of the two leagues uh, that came together after a somewhat uh, disastrous 1967, competing against each other to create at least one uh, standalone league in 1968. And you're going to hear uh, an amazing set of stories from Clive in our chat in a few minutes uh, about sort of uh, what sort of transpired there. As a matter of fact, it was basically the league on life support for a, a few years. Uh, and then slowly but surely through the efforts of uh, of Clive Toy, Phil Woosnam, and a handful of other uh, long-term believers, Lamar Hunt, of course, and, and a few others, uh, got the league uh, back on its feet and then some into uh, just a, an absolute crazy time in the latter part of the decade in the early 1980s. Uh, we get into all of that, not only the league, but the teams like the Baltimore Bays uh, of the MPSL and then NASL, uh, the New York Cosmos, which, uh, with, which Clive Toy was uh, essentially the architect of, at least until uh, 1977 or so, when uh, the team really was rocketing to uh, the super stratosphere. Uh, the Chicago Sting makes an appearance for a couple of years, uh, as well as the Toronto Blizzard, as we've uh, mentioned before. A lot more uh, to come in our conversation with uh, the American Soccer Hall of Famer Clive Toy uh, in just a couple of seconds. Please stay tuned for that. You're going to love it, uh, I assure you. A couple of uh, promotional friends and notes we want to share with you. We want to uh, say hello again to our relatively new sponsors, OldSchoolShirts.com, our friends out of Cincinnati that uh, have just an amazing array, and you're going to find a lot of North American Soccer League stuff in there. Maybe some NPSL uh, uh, jerseys and shirts and uh, t-shirts, et cetera, as well. I don't know about jerseys, but shirts for sure. Uh, and it is the place to find just an amazing uh, trove of, uh, of shirts with uh, all kinds of uh, great logos and teams uh, no longer with us, leagues, as well as just cool uh, cultural stuff uh, from uh, decades past as well. You're just going to get lost uh, in oldschoolshirts.com. And of course, when you find something you like, and you're going to find something, I'm, I'm pretty sure of that, use the promo code GOODSEATS at checkout and get 10% off of all of your purchases. Oldschoolshirts.com. Give it a try. Take a look. I guarantee you're going to find it really cool. And uh, make sure you use that promo code GOODSEATS to get your 10% off uh, all of your purchases. Uh, and once you're done there, I want you to uh, point your browser, why don't you, to our uh, our friends also at sportshistorycollectibles.com. Uh, no relation, despite the uh, the similar sounding site. Uh, sportshistorycollectibles.com, run by our friend Dean Mitchell out in uh, San Diego, uh, has uh, just an amazing array of uh, memorabilia so uh, from teams and leagues and, and uh, nearly departed or dearly departed uh, franchises uh, no longer with us. So once you find that shirt or two to uh, reminisce about the team or the league that you're missing uh, desperately, why not go over to sportshistorycollectibles.com and find a few actual artifacts from said team? That could be press guides or bumper stickers or uh, media guides. Uh, uh, occasionally there's some uh, some outerwear or shirts, uh, but programs and uh, uh, yearbooks and you name it, pennants, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and there's new inventory almost every week, and it's uh, beautifully photographed. Uh, and uh, again, you will get lost there as well. SportsHistoryCollectibles.com. And of course, we got a promo code for you there too. And that is, can you believe it? Good Seats. Good Seats is the promo code for SportsHistoryCollectibles.com. Get 15% off all of your purchase, purchases, he says, there. That's SportsHistoryCollectibles.com. And we thank them for their sponsorship of our little show here as well. All right, let's uh, segue right into our great conversation. Uh, this is one I've been anticipating for quite some time, and I was uh, privileged uh, to have uh, some time to chat with uh, the great, the legendary, and the very instrumental uh, builder uh, of much of the North American Soccer League uh, through much of its uh, of its history. Just about, he was pretty much there from the beginning till the end. His name is Clive Toy, and here's our conversation coming up. Maybe it would help the audience a bit to sort of give a little bit of background of of Clive Toy before and then how he became ensnared in this American <laughs> soccer thing. You mean with stupidity or ambition? I mean, which of those two would you prefer? <laughs> well, I, I, I sense it's a, a, a melange of the two. <laughs> the, um, I was a journalist. 
I started as a journalist when I was 17. In those days, once you had a decent education, you didn't waste your time going to college for four years. So I started as a journalist at the age of 17, became the chief sports writer of that newspaper, moved to a bigger one, moved to a bigger one, and became the chief football writer for the Daily Express, which at that time was the largest circulation newspaper in the English-speaking world, four and a half million a day, syndicated from all over the world, from Vancouver to the South China Morning Post, um, and uh, in the process was sent uh, to all over the world to cover soccer, which included once in 61 being sent to uh, North America. First time I'd been here, I'd been to Asia before. I was in the, uh, in the Army in the Korean War, and I'd been all over Europe covering soccer, but this was my first trip to uh, North America and all kinds of stuff to cover. Uh, World Cup golf in Dorado Beach, Puerto Rico, uh, four four-minute milers up at Harvard Stadium, world title fight, and a rather unimportant thing called the International Soccer League, which was put together by a fellow called Bill Cox, who during the war, I gather, had... Um, owned the Philadelphia baseball team and got chucked at a baseball for some misdemeanor. Um, and Bill would invite teams from overseas into New York once a year uh, to play this International Soccer League. Uh, he had a local team, the New York Americans, um, and on this occasion had two, two clubs from Britain, Kilmarnock from Scotland, Everton from uh, England, and uh, so I covered all of that in the course of that, met Bill Cox, uh, who said, one day we're going to have a professional league in, uh, in America, build the game. Wonderful, I said. You know, that's interesting. So I wrote eight paragraphs about that on a quiet day when there was nothing else to write about. It was hardly, it seemed, the most important story of the year. And uh, as the years passed by, Bill, very nice fellow, I got on with him very well. He used to come and see me in New York to uh, ask me phone numbers for this team or that team that he was bringing over. And on one occasion, he turned up with another bunch of American guys who talked about, oh, yes, we want to start a professional league, etc. But with the World Cup coming up in England, 66, I wasn't too interested, although I did write some stories. And I wrote one story about the fact that um, Phil Woosnam, uh, who was then a player with Aston Villa, Phil Woosnam had shown interest in going to America. And so there was a story in the paper. Woosnam was interested. Um, strange that Phil ended up, um, Phil and I ended up uh, running the league. But uh, who would have known that at the time? So uh, eventually, the after the World Cup was over, Everyone came back again, talking seriously about um, starting the, uh, the league. And um, as I'd covered everything in soccer by then, uh, it seemed a bit interesting. My wife and I said, well, why don't we go to America and introduce soccer and have some fun and learn some things and see a different place and come back again to England in two years' time. So I said, I want a job. And I offered, got offered five or six jobs, took one of them as general manager of the Baltimore Bays. And that was 51 years ago. And the two years that we intended to stay here have somewhat lengthened. Well, so let's back up for a second. So uh, did you, um, uh, the ISL, right? So an interesting story. We, we've uh, delved a little bit into it as sort of the primordial, primordial ooze, if you will, of uh, what became the uh, uh, three, I guess, then became two. Um, professional leagues that kind of get going in, in 67. But um, what was your impression of the ISL? Because obviously, uh, how can I best put this? Uh, that that notion of bringing, quote unquote, the best uh, international talent to these shores uh, has, has seemingly been uh, and still is, right, with the International Champions Cup and, and, and Charlie Stilitano and those folks, uh, still sort of that... Um, uh, I don't know, that that aura, right, that uh, the American populace will only uh, enjoy the best that is there is there is on the planet. And the only way that they're going to really get to soccer is to see the best of soccer here on the shores versus mm. starting something new. Mm. No, I mean, Bill Cox was doing it because no one was going to turn up and pay 50 cents to watch any local players play. I mean, the, there were various ethnic groups where pretty decent players emerged, but... Uh, they were confined to 
Little Italy in New York or, uh, you know, the Colombians down in Kendall in, in Florida. I mean, as a whole, uh, that was never going to get in the papers. So by doing what Bill Cox was doing, he was doing that to introduce the game more and more to people uh, in the hope that they would then one day be interested in the league that he wanted to start. Um, I mean, what Charlie Stilatano and his mob are doing now has got nothing to do with growing soccer. It's to do with making money uh, because soccer's already grown. You still get a looking at the the attendances uh, this weekend in MLS. I mean, 30,000, 40,000, 50,000. Yeah, that'll do. Um, so it is a different thing. The, the, the international games then were meant to promote the game. The international games now are to make money for those who are promoting the international games and has nothing to do with promoting the game. A clear distinction. So uh, give me a sense then, um, when you heard from uh, Bill Cox and his uh, ideations of what a professional league would look like, right? His was not the only one, right? It seems like obviously he would have had a tremendous head start given that international uh, uh, experience, you know, in the in the years prior to '67. But uh, there, there were there were three, I think, actual groups of of moneyed individuals that were all circling around this uh, newly hot proposition post '66 to start a professional league. Maybe I, I'd love to hear your sort of perceptions of that uh, all of a suddenness, I guess, of of interest to to launch leagues and and three of them at that. Well, you know, there was the, the World Cup of 66. One game was televised, maybe more than one game. I'm aware of the fact that there was some television and there was a lot of publicity given to that game compared to the complete ignorance uh, offered in the past. And the International Soccer League, I don't know what their crowds were, but although even though I attended a number of their games, but they were respectable. Um, the problem, I think, emerged um, long before I actually set foot in this country to, to, to take the job, um, was that Bill and some of, the, uh, some of the other owners did not respect each other too much. And um, uh, the first job I was offered uh, was as a publicity director for the Hartford Mules, um, which was to be owned by Bill Cox, whom I knew better than any of the others. And you may say to yourself, oh, don't remember the Hartford Mules. The reason you don't remember the Hartford Mules is that Bill never got the money for it. And so that club never existed. And that first job I was offered disappeared one night. Um, so uh, Bill, poor Bill, um, whose idea it was for reasons, financial reasons that are you know, a complete mystery to me, just that... Uh, he and the other people didn't get on. The other people didn't get on with each other. And so one bunch of people formed the National Professional Soccer League, where you sign your own players and you wear your own club. And the other mob, United Soccer Association, or whatever it was called, uh, invited foreign teams in to play in their cities as their own team. I forget the names and who they were, but I remember... Cleveland brought in Stoke City from the English First Division and called themselves the Cleveland Stokers, and other people did similar things. And at the end of the first year, um, that uh, obviously was an idea that uh, could not be repeated too often, didn't do much good. And so the two leagues merged, became the North American Soccer League, and started on that journey. Well, so the, you know. It's the, all the ownership ramifications, um, I cannot explain because I don't know because part of the time I wasn't here. In any case, I wasn't an owner. In any case, I couldn't understand what the devil out these people were talking about. Well, all right. So, so give me a sense then of the of the MPSL. So you were recruited essentially to be the general manager of the Baltimore Bays uh, of 67, right? Which was the, um, the first year of the MPSL, obviously competing against the USA. Um, right. And, and uh, maybe a bit of an explanation or an understanding of how you saw the league. I mean, I, it was clearly the league that had a national television contract, right? But it was also at the same time, right, the one that 
uh, did not have the official for what for for what it's worth, but uh, clearly we found out it is worth something. FIFA blessing uh, to play. I'm really curious to hear your I don't know some remembrances of what sort of running a team in one of these two now professional leagues uh, in Baltimore and. It's interesting, too. The owner, uh, I guess, was sort of a beer baron, right? Hofberger, Gerald Hofberger. Um, yeah, that's curious right. Curious sort of the dynamics of that team uh, that year. Well, I mean, the difference, a huge difference between the NPSL and the other mob is that we were signing our own players. We were playing our own team. We were out promoting the game and promoting our players in the local communities. We were signing players from the local communities when we could find them that were any good. And we had our feet firmly entrenched in the city in which we were building the the team. The other mob arrived, played, and left again. Um, And in some instances, we did quite well. Um, In some, we did appallingly. Uh, But, I mean, we had decent crowds in Baltimore. I forget what they were. But we used to get a lot of publicity about the game. Um, We used to go out. Our players and coaches would go out and help people coach and help people play, kids play and all the rest of it. Um, And we were there to not just develop our team, but to help develop the game. And some of us in some other cities were able to do that, and some simply were not. But at the end of the first year of the NESL, the animosity and stupidity uh, which existed among some of the ownership groups, and, you know, I can't, honestly remember who were the worst um, because we had really bad ones still to come. Uh, but uh, they, they helped bring the NESL almost to extinction. Um, and so I left the Baltimore Bays and Phil Woosnam left the Atlanta Chiefs and we set up office, the NESL office in the uh, visitor's locker room at Atlanta Stadium. And uh, off we went to try and build the league, keep it in business and build it, which, you know, we did um, with great help from some of the ownership, Atlanta for one, Lamar Hunt in Dallas for another one. Uh, one of my jobs was to go out and try and persuade various people in various cities um, who'd expressed some interest in soccer to increase that interest and join us. <coughs> And one side enticed them enough to feel that there was a chance there. Then Lamar would join me. And so here was the Texan billionaire and the penniless Brit going out together, um, sharing economy class flights and sharing a room in a rundown motel to save money for the league, uh, talking to people and trying to get them into the league, which... We were able to do so that the league did increase, did did, did keep on growing. And um, uh, one of our tasks, of course, to, was to do something in New York. And um, by chance, we found the ownership for New York. And um, that's what happened at the Cosmos. All right. Well, so before we get to the Cosmos, though, I, I, you're, you're glossing over a little bit. I just want to, uh, the dark days of the NASL, right? So after 67 with the two leagues and then 68, which was arguably a, a, the better shot to have one United League together, 1969, 1970, maybe even a little 71, probably the darkest days of that league, right? Because you were down to, I think, five teams, at least on paper. I suspect that there were weeks or days where it might have even been less than that. Um, I just, a little bit of uh, insight into sort of those dark days. I think that there's not a lot of, there hasn't been a lot of discussion or at least uh, stories that I've sort of been able to unearth that kind of really speak to just how grave, if you will, the situation was, um, you know, it was, it was, uh, one breath away from death. I mean, that's, that's for sure. As they say, the, the entire league office was Phil Woosnam and myself, the vast space we had was the visitor's locker room in Atlanta Stadium with two desks and two telephones. Um, and uh, we had five clubs. We did, we did whatever we could to keep something going and, um, uh, you know, rushed around and managed to do it and managed to uh, then managed to persuade one or two people who were in some other league, the American Soccer League. I mean, my memory fails when I come to these horror stories. 
um, but we managed to persuade them uh, to Rochester, for example, the Rochester Lancers. Um, managed to persuade them to come and join us, and you know, certainly we survived. And uh, 71 came, we found um, ownership for New York, and so the league, we managed to have an office um, and a secretary if, uh, to help Phil Woosnam. And I left the um, league office and took over the New York task. Well, um, so the question before we get to New York, so um, yeah, I guess the question is um, why? Why continue? What was the the rationale behind uh, when things were really quite <laughs> dire, right? Because in many respects, right, you think about it, right? You, 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 if you think about this period of time, right, you've gone from the United States has gone from a a period where you had no no fewer than three actual ownership groups looking to start and establish leagues, and three years later, literally, it it, it would be hard to to argue that that felt or could feel like rejection, like the 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 patient is rejecting the transplant, if you will, of the sport. No. You have to understand, no, no, no. You're not talking about rejection of the game. You're talking about rejection of each other's. Um, they could not, there were so many, could not stand each other. No, we want to do it this way. No, we want to do it that way. No, we want to do it some other way. Ah, to the devil with you. I mean, we had a bunch of idiots um, floating around who um, just didn't know what the devil they were talking about um, and didn't like each other in many cases, and that was it. So it had nothing to do with the game. It had everything to do with that we survived because of good owners and we were in those dreadful days because of a bunch of idiots. That's interesting because I think it's it's really interesting and important to understand or hear sort of the the belief in the sport, the game uh, itself, if only done in a more, you know, uh, uh, traditional or, or professional uh, and or well-reasoned and well-thought-out manner. And it seems to me like you're saying that a lot of it had to do with sort of greed, avarice, uh, disagreement, uh, and, and people getting in the way of each other versus the quality uh, and the uh, the oh, sanctity of the listen, I'm not, I'm not sure how many of the silly devils actually ever saw a game. They just, oh, 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 there's something exciting. What was, oh, what was that on television? Oh, Charlie down the road says he wants a club. Oh, let's get in. I mean, I didn't meet all of them. But, I mean, I met a number of them, and by goodness me, am I glad I had nothing to do with them. Um, and we had a few like that later in the, in, the, in the whole thing, which caused eventually the decline. So, I mean, ownership is a very important factor, and if they are prepared to be serious about it, you can do something. If they're idiots, uh, I mean, the mob that owned Philadelphia later in the day, a bunch of uh, British rock stars, I forget their name, but superstars. I mean, for heaven's sake, what a complete fiasco they r ran the club with. Uh, it, so, I mean, the idiocy of ownership is a major factor in those dark days, as you call it, of the uh, whatever it was, the late 60s. Um, we had some good owners, and they're the ones who were still around when we, uh, we reached a level of, uh, of success. And then the ownership came again, in my opinion, and destroyed the uh, NESL after we had built so much towards the future of the game. All right. Well, let's let's uh, we'll come back to that one. Right. That will put a push pin on that one, because uh, clearly the ownership uh, issues will uh, not go away and, and, and be very interesting in the later years. But maybe some background then on the well, I'm going to assume the importance long term or eventually of having a franchise in New York. And maybe a little bit of understanding as to perhaps how this Cosmos thing came about in the first place, circa 1971. <laughs> well, you know, the whether it was good or bad, the decisions that were made to rebuild and keep the league going were made by Phil and myself, who was them and myself. And we reached a number of conclusions when we were sitting in that um, locker room that um, New York was vital. Um, we had to find the right uh, owners who had the right amount of money and at least owners who had the right amount of money who would hire me to run the club and that Phil would run the league and that we needed to get start to build to get the World Cup hosted in the United States and we needed to get Pele, the two big things 
were the World Cup and Pele, um, starting with you know the growth of the league in New York, etc. So we worked on those things and um, found the ownership in New York completely by chance. Um, I don't know if you remember the name David Frost, who was a big TV personality in the UK Certainly. and also became so in, in the United States. I think he was big interviewing Richard Nixon, all kinds of stuff. Anyway, I used to do a lot of work on the BBC, including a, a talk show with uh, with David Frost. And I thought, well, he must have got some money. Let's go and I don't know any Americans. I don't know any American millionaires. So let me try David Frost. And his lawyer said, oh, he's interested, but he doesn't have that kind of money. You should speak to Nesby Erdogan. So I said, oh, yeah, who's Nesby Erdogan? So he explained that Nesby was uh, music, uh, Atlantic Records, Warner Communications, and big soccer fan. And we said, okay, how do we pin him down? And by chance, Phil, well, Phil Luzner was at a, um, went to the World Cup in Mexico in 70 and attended a number of functions. And one of the functions, he was introduced to Nesby Erdogan. So Phil, uh, as I've said in my book, Phil, Phil didn't miss that open goal. He grabbed Nesby and talked to him, persuaded him. And before you know it, we had the ownership for New York. And before you know it, I was general manager of the New York and we had to find a name, and I made myself unpopular with the owners because I came up with the name Cosmos. And Nesri, won, Nesri and Ahmed, his brother in the music business, wanted to call it the, call the club the New York Blues, and I thought that had nothing to offer. And somebody else said, oh, get some publicity, call the team the New York Lovers and have pink uniforms and whatever. And um, so I concocted a competition to name the club and forged some applicants and came up with the name Cosmos, which is the one that I wanted. So uh, that's how we became the Cosmos. So uh, a little bit of, of, of trivia here or a little bit of uh, 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 deeper into this. So we had uh, Waylon Moore on uh, a number of months ago, who was the artist, I think, who was... Uh, uh, yes, the Cosmos logo. Indeed. So, um, and I think he was a little uncertain as to sort of how the name sort of truly came about. Now, I've seen or heard... And again, the internet's a crazy thing, right? So do you trust it as far as you can throw it, right? But, you know, what what the name of the Cosmos, right? Was that the specific name or was it, I heard Cosmopolitans and it was a shortening of that, a no. la the New York Mets? What, what was sort of the Very, back? very, okay. Listen, it was my, my thinking to come up with a name. The previous professional sports team to emerge in New York were the Mets, and their full name was Metropolitans, right? So I thought, now, what can I do to best that? Well, Cosmopolitan is bigger than Metropolitan, and I can shorten Cosmopolitan to Cosmos, and what's bigger than the Cosmos? That's it, the biggest thing you can possibly do. So I said Cosmos. Then, to get agreement, I had a competition in which I asked people to name the club, crossing my fingers that someone would come up with the name Cosmos and I could then tell the ownership, look, sorry, not the Blues, not the whatever. We got some of our fans come up with a name. And two high school teachers in Queens, I don't remember their names, uh, sent the letter in saying Cosmos. So, boom, that's it. I got a few friends to write a few other letters uh, to support Cosmos. I remember opening the, <laughs> opening the mail. It was at an executive committee meeting of the United States Soccer Federation. And uh, I was so excited, so pleased when someone said Cosmos that uh, Gene Edwards, the president, said, do you think you can stop opening the mail now and get on with the meeting? Now you know what you want to call a stupid club. So I said, yes. So that's how the Cosmos came about. That's where the mixture of Cosmos and Cosmopolitan came about, uh, all my fault, and into the public view because of those two high school teachers in uh, in Queens who had the same idea. Whose uh, names, by the way, according to my research, is are Meyer Diller and Al Capelli, and uh, they were at Martin Van Buren High School in Queens. So that's a, an interesting little little story. So yes, yeah, we well, said that's that's the two. If that's the the, the names I said so long ago. I can't remember the names, but by heavens, 
those were the two two high school teachers in Queens who uh, who came up with a name that uh, uh, helped me do that. Very interesting. Um, well, I'm glad you set that sort of uh, myth uh, to rest. That's uh, that that helps a lot, I think. In the uh, and it's partially why we do this, right? Because a lot of this is oral history. Uh, you know, things that uh, that elude us in terms of uh, certainty. Um, all right. So, okay. So, you, 19 set late 70, early 71. You are now thrust into this uh, this new situation, a New York team in a league that's uh, you know still. Not quite uh, resuscitated yet, shall we say? Uh, give, give us some insight as to your, your first days and and how you were, shall we say, managing upward with this uh, literally rock star uh, ownership group. Well, fortunately, I had very little to do with the ownership group. Um, th- they uh, relegated conversation with me to. Uh, very nice fellow who was only with them a year. I, I don't know. He wasn't at the top rank of Warner, maybe the second or third rank. I don't know. Um, and um, I had no problems with dealing with them. I was left to myself to do whatever. So I did whatever and um, found the right coach and um, to a certain extent, the right players through, through the coach, Gordon Bradley. And um, we worked at building the game, building the name, as well as obviously building our attendance. Um, and um, I mean, we did so much work in the area. Uh, we used to have a thing called the Cosmos Coaches Corner, and we sent, you know, Gordon started it, and then we sent players out every night into areas, into people's homes where they got the local coaches in or into a bar or wherever to talk about the cosmos, to talk about soccer to the people who already had some interest or could be persuaded to have some interest, which is why you ended up with signs all over the place after a few years, cosmos country. Well, that's what it was, cosmos country. And the cartoonist in the Daily News had this cartoon, which I wish I'd kept a copy of it, which showed two... Um, seats in a locker room and one of them was large and there was an American football on it and next was this thin little thing with a soccer ball on it and then the next one was they were closer to the same size and the next one they were the same size and the next one the American football is two inches and the soccer ball is eight inches so that was the the way people felt at that time that we had developed I'm not saying we overtook uh, the football teams there in every respect, but by heavens, we were there. So, Yankee Stadium, right? That was the the starting point, right? So you're thinking big, and it sounds like you're not getting too much uh, interference, shall we say, from from the ownership groups, right? So uh, a little bit of uh, uh, overwhelmed or underwhelmed. Uh, you're you're uh, is Yankee Stadium the right place to play? Uh, and Gordon Bradley, right? He had played with the uh, New York Generals of. Um, was that the NPSL? Yes, they were part of the NPSL. So he had a little bit of familiar, familiarity with sort of what, what the on-field, uh, I guess, performance would or could look like. Well, no, I mean, Gordon had played before all over the place and uh, was playing and coaching in the German-American League, which is the strongest local ethnic league. Um, and uh, he played and coached New York Hotel, one of their best teams, uh, because I, I wasn't going overseas to to find the first people. I wanted to get into those ethnic leagues that existed in New York and steal the best from there and got you know, enormous help from the German-American League, which changed its name to the Cosmopolitan League after they became well associated with us. So I, I had to get people. I didn't know New York, and I didn't know the soccer people in New York. I became knowledgeable of the soccer people, I, I, but I needed knowledge locally. Gordon was the perfect mix as the local knowledge, local contacts, and a good coach and a very hard worker. Uh, so that's what we got, a bunch of hard workers who uh, really went out not just to build the cosmos, but to build the knowledge of the game. And we, we ended up, I think it was every Tuesday, I think, we, we had arranged to go We'd find a high school somewhere which had a beautiful field and all the rest of it. 
and work out the details with the, the high school that we were going to train on Tuesday morning on, on their field and all classes would be abandoned for two hours and all the kids and everybody would sit there and watch the Cosmos train and get autographs and that kind of stuff. Um, I mean, that's one of the many things we did. Uh, I used to say, we don't expect you to come and see us, pay to see us, until we've been to see you. And therefore, we would go and see you and make the speeches or make the coaching or do whatever was necessary to get to the Greek Americans, the German Americans, the American Americans, the whatever Americans, uh, and tell them about the cosmos and about soccer. So this is grassroots, right? This is this is a complete 180, right, from what the ambitious owners of the previous leagues uh, uh, and uh, and teams, right, were doing, which is more you know, uh, not that, right? Not growing the roots, so to speak, right? This seems like it's very no, involve the community kind of approach. No, no. I mean, the NPSL, the clubs that existed from the NPSL and converted to the NESL and state, they, to a degree, were doing the same kind of thing. The U.S., whatever it was called, the other mob who imported foreign teams, didn't have a clue. Um and I don't, I don't know if any of them, maybe one or two of them, uh, ended up common sense and joined the NESL. Um, but it was a totally different approach to the whole thing. We were trying to build the game of soccer and doing so by having a league and having people employed to run a club and to promote the game in their territory and anywhere else if they could. I mean, it was quite simple. Um, but it didn't necessarily uh, translate into huge crowds, right? Either at Yankee Stadium, I mean, by the end of that first season, right, you're already looking at... Yeah. Uh, well, this is, why would it translate into huge crowds? I mean, people were still saying, what's soccer? Oh, what's the World Cup? Oh, what's a national team? You know, I mean, soccer was not here. It may have visited, and it may have been in the clutches and minds and hearts of ethnic groups, but it wasn't here. And what had to be done was to build the game while building clubs and using the clubs and their personnel to build the game. And that worked where it worked and it didn't work where ownership disagreed. Interesting. So so then, OK, so Yankee Stadium, right? You're there. But um, so the move to Hofstra, right, for the next two seasons, was that because... Uh, Yankee Stadium was largely too large and or not drawing? Was it because of the, I guess, uh, pending or I guess it was approaching renovation? Or were you maybe sort of saying, look, maybe we need to take a step back and be a little bit more um, intimate, I guess, perhaps in our settings before we kind of grow bigger uh, than continue no, Yankee Yankee Stadium? No, 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 no. The problem with Yankee Stadium was that they didn't want us playing if the field was wet. Ah. So therefore, there's a regulation. I forget what the time was for a Saturday or Sunday game, but if there's an evening kickoff at 7 o'clock, if it rained, they had the right to cancel the game any time up until 4 o'clock on the day we had a game kicking off at 7 o'clock. Now, how many seasons can you stick and doing that knowing that people may be turning up and they turn up and find, oh, well, it isn't raining, but it was, and the Yankees said we can't play. I mean, a totally ridiculous thing, but there was no way of avoiding it because that was the first year, and then they kept um, on pushing that. So got to get out of Yankee Stadium. We're not playing in a blasted baseball field anymore. And uh, Hofstra seemed the right place, um, stayed the right place until Giant Stadium was in the offing. And so I moved into Randall's Island then so that we were not trying to move all the way from Long Island to New Jersey, so to speak. And so that's when we played at Randall's Island, and that's when other things happened, including Pelé, and then Giant Stadium, and away we went. All right, so the, so you're saying that the Giant Stadium thing was a already a glint in your eye in the mid-'70s, even before you had moved to Downing Stadium from Hofstra. Well, I mean, I can't remember what the sequence was, but once I knew Giant Stadium was being built, then that was the place I knew we had to go. But I, I can't remember what day it was that I thought that, but it was it was bloody obvious, particularly as Sonny Werblin, who was responsible for the place, um, 
had decided that the field would be wide enough for soccer, not like most American football stadiums, where you know the, their game is is a narrower field, and so therefore we had to play on a narrower field. But Sonny Werblin had the idea that oh, there's going to be soccer crowds, so let's build Giant Stadium wide enough for a real full-size soccer field. And so with that knowledge as well, and the the, the belief in my mind that we were going to have Pelé and big crowds, that was the obvious place to think about. All right, so so get, let's get some sense of then as you're moving into into Randall's Island and Downing Stadium, and and you know, I, charitably, um, you know, uh, <laughs> if. I wouldn't. I was decrepit, but it was certainly not necessarily the uh, the highest order uh, uh, stadium. Obviously, it had some appeal, right? Because as did the uh, w, WFL World Football League team, the New York Stars, right? See, it uh, at least it's close to Manhattan. It's uh, interestingly located, somewhat centrally, but arguably very difficult to get to. Um, maybe some sense of those years, and then as part of that, this Pele thing, because you've already mentioned the potential pursuit of him in the first place. But I get the sense that the idea of Pele, right, especially one who has been here previous in years prior with lots of different uh, Santos visits uh, in international matches, ISL included, uh, that this was almost perhaps part of the process, maybe even when the Cosmos was was formed, that Pele would ultimately at least be given a fair shot to be brought to the United States. Is that is that correct? No, 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 no. Stupid or not, there are things that Phil and I decided had to happen and we would do our best to make them happen. Getting the World Cup in the country was one thing. Getting Pele playing in New York was another thing. So all those things were not just, oh, well, what about this? We had it, you know, we had it written down, so to speak. This is what we're going to do. Um, and this is what we will try to do. Uh, and this is what we did. So it wasn't any question of, all right, well, now, oh, maybe we'll get Pele, so maybe we should have a bigger stadium. The whole thing was the rubbish that Phil and I came up with in uh, in whatever years it was when we were running the league. Um, and we had support for those ideas from some people, and we had laughter and ridicule from some people for those ideas. But those are the ideas that we had. And, uh, you know, good, bad, or indifferent, we are the ones who decided that's what we want to do, and that's what we will try and do. And I said, the idea was that Phil would run the league, and I would run New York, and we managed to make it work for a while. (laughs) Um, Well, look, in 74, right, This the league actually was uh, quite uh, uh, on the ascendance, right? I mean, you had uh, teams out in in San Jose, and you had uh, Tampa Bay starting to come into play, and, and you know, obviously some other markets, even this is even before uh, the arrival of, of Pelé, right? So there were clearly some green shoots uh, going on across the league, uh, if not necessarily uh, New York proper per se, but it had to give you some hope that, you know what, that sticking to the game plan here and maybe adding in some of these pieces long dreamt, such as a Pelé, uh, would uh, perhaps uh, grow to some real stature and, and size, uh, given where you were a few years prior. Not would, perhaps, but would, of course. Uh, We were making progress, uh, not in every single city, but very much making progress. And then decisions were made um, uh, to uh, to get rid of Phil Woosnam, um, which was a a mistake. And uh, he was replaced by a person who did not know anything about what had happened, did not know anything about what should happen, did not know anything about anything, and um, uh, was a destructive force uh, beyond measure. Interesting. So um, maybe Pele, let's let's talk about the pursuit, right? Obviously, the documentary uh, sort of got into it a bit, but you were obviously very much uh, uh, enmeshed in this uh, in this long term pursuit of the world's greatest player. Um, maybe a little bit of. Uh, a little bit of insight, a little bit of intrigue as to it wasn't a straight line to get him, was it? No, I mean, it was it was simple in the sense that he had to be persuaded to come to America um, because he still had a contract with Santos. It was coming to an end. Um, they, of course, were 
you know, pushed another contract in front of him. They were very sad that he was leaving. Uh, and Juventus in Italy and um, Real Madrid in Spain were both uh, interested in him. And he didn't have an agent. Um, and so if you wanted to talk about him, you talk to him about him. And so shortly after the Cosmos were founded, early 71, uh, um, Brazil, or maybe in Santos, I forget, it was the club or the national team, were playing in uh, Kingston, Jamaica. And as that's a lot closer than uh, Santos, I um, hopped on the plane down to uh, Jamaica with Kurt Lamb, who was the general secretary of the federation then, very nice, helpful fellow, big soccer fan, who had known Pele personally for some time. Um, and I didn't know Pele personally. I knew him. I'd seen him many times, but he didn't know me. And so Kurt went with me and introduced me, and I talked to Pele uh, in uh, Kingston and said, we're building the game in America, and I want you, et cetera, et cetera. And um, as I found out afterwards, he said uh, to Julio Matze, who was their physio and became Pele's guide, you might say, <clears throat> um, what the devil is he talking about? Or words to that effect. So, but at least he knew me. Uh, then, and then the Santos played it, uh, an exhibition game against uh, America, um, or one of the teams from Cali in Colombia, Deportivo Cali, I think it was. And before the game, I um, went on the field with Pele and uh, retired the Cosmos number ten shirt and gave him a Cosmos number ten shirt and say, you know, you'll wear this, this one day. And we had a big laugh, and from then on. I pestered him to death um, wherever I had the time to go and uh, talk to him. And it you know, got better and better as time went on. And we finally, um, in Brussels, he was playing in a game, a testimonial game, for Paul Van Hempst, the Belgian coach, national coach. And um, we finally got down to it where he said, OK, I will play. And so we signed a few rough pieces of paper. In fact, on the, um, I pulled a piece of notepaper out from the drawer of the hotel, the GB Motor Inn in uh, Brussels, and uh, Pelly scrawled on it and signed it. And I said, okay, you know, um, I'll meet you again in two weeks' time. He had to go somewhere for uh, some other thing. And we agreed to meet in Rome a couple of weeks' time. And I Went back home and got contracts, etc., and went back to Rome and got a bit further, and uh, had it went to Santos. I often think I should have bought a season ticket to uh, to get on the plane to to Brazil. I went there so many times, um, but all together, then it was done. He agreed. We met in Bermuda and signed all the contracts, and two days later caused chaos at the Club 21 when we had the press conference. It was chaos. I, I've seen some uh, some footage and some some uh, uh, snapshots of that. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, yeah any, any memories of that? Because it seems like everybody in the world, literally and figuratively, from the press uh, showed up. And uh, although Pele was a little late, too, I think, right? Um, do you know, I don't know if he was or not. I mean, those days were utter, absolute chaos. Uh, I mean, one minute we're we're you know a club we're doing all right you know considering, and the next day we're you know nothing bigger in the world than uh, than Pele, um, and we still only had two or three people running the club. I didn't so sort of, uh, have a great staff to do things. We were doing everything ourselves. I mean, sometimes when we had a big crowd, I used to have to grab tickets from the ticket office and stand outside and sell people tickets to stop the lines becoming too long. I mean, we had two or three people running the whole blasted thing. And um, I knew we were going to have uh, a press, you know, decent showing the press conference, but I wanted it at somewhere like Club 21 because that was upscale New York rather than downscale New York, which is where the game had been always. And but I had no idea we we're going to get that many. I mean, it was mob scene, absolute mob scene. So 
as it was a few days later when he played his first game. All right, so let, let's talk about that first game because uh, we had um, we had Kyle Rook Jr. on uh, a number of months ago, and I, I, I quizzed him on uh, what I tried to piece together was sort of a bit of the history of that that first game because it's my understanding, and I think most, mostly corroborated by Kyle, was this... Uh, so it was an exhibition game. It was, uh, I want to call it hastily arranged, but it seems like it was uh, in retrospect. CBS, right? A, a national live broadcast, right? Which was uh, quite something. But my understanding was that Dallas had a game literally that night before in San Antonio. And it had to be in New York, like for a two o'clock game for a nationally televised audience at that uh, to uh, introduce Pelé. Uh, this, it, it boggles my mind. And obviously, you know, this is years later, right? So in hindsight, but that you'd be able to schedule an exhibition game in the middle of the NASL season, get a CBS to drop everything or somehow squeeze it in. Um, it, it, I, I, must ima- I must imagine that uh, not only the signing in, of Pele itself, but the days before and the days during of, of the, getting him here must have been just at, uh, not only chaos, but just completely uh, uncharted uh, craziness to get that all together. Well, I, I think that... Um... I probably worked about 48 hours a day in that uh, in that period. Um, things had to be done. There was very few of us to do it, um, but we did it. And, you know, I don't recall Dallas having to play in San Antonio. I have no idea, but I do know that we didn't have a game that weekend. And with Pelly, we had to have a game that weekend to start the whole process. And I arranged, you know, Dallas agreed to play. And did play, um, and um, within a day or so, I mean, not only um, did we get TV, but we had sponsors who wanted to put their signs on the field. Um, they came out of the blue and had to negotiate those deals, and there were there were so many things that had to be done uh, to get us from being, you know, minor league to. <laughs> the biggest thing there was for a day. <laughs> so it was fairly chaotic, yes. All right, just when it was getting interesting, let's uh, let's bring this uh, to a grinding halt, shall we? Ah, just kidding. Uh, we got to pay the bills around here, and uh, our friends at Audible have been very helpful in attempting to allow us to pay some of those bills, and uh, we want to call them out now uh, and remind you that uh, a free audiobook download is yours for the taking, and also a free one month. Uh, subscription to the service uh, of Audible at audibletrial.com slash goodseats. Again, audibletrial.com slash goodseats for your free one-month trial of the Audible service and, interestingly, most interestingly, a free audiobook download for you to enjoy. 180,000 titles and growing uh, every day to choose from, and there's uh, absolutely no excuse to not find at least one title amongst that uh, cavernous uh, selection uh, available to you that uh, you won't find to be enjoyable and uh, and good for the soul, including uh, a couple of books that might be interesting to our audience. And yes, some new ones, frankly, uh, that I'm finally listening to. One that I'm listening to right now uh, is by Carson Cunningham. It's narrated by Paul Bamer, and it's called Underbelly Hoops, Adventures in the CBA, a.k.a. the Crazy Basketball Association, which is really, of course, about uh, the Continental Basketball Association, which for many years uh, was sort of this ragtag minor league uh, of the NBA, and that's uh, it's a book I'm about two chapters into right now, and uh, hopefully maybe a guest will get uh, for a future episode. Also, uh, in my queue, next up uh, is another guest that I'd like to get, uh, and her book that she wrote is also uh, narrated by her. Her name is Jeannie Buss, and of course, Jeannie is the daughter of Jerry Buss, of course, the uh, wildly successful founder of the Los Angeles Lakers and the LA Forum, and Jeannie is, uh, is clearly today the brains behind uh, the Los Angeles Lakers today. Uh, She and her brothers were uh, active, of course, in things like, along with her father, uh, World Team Tennis, uh, the Major Indoor Soccer League with the LA Lasers, all kinds of stuff. So uh, her book is next on my list. That's called Laker Girl. And that too is available on Audible. And again, it's one of the uh, the many thousands of titles that you can choose from uh, when you go to audibletrial.com slash goodseats. And again, you too can get your free audiobook download to give it a try, perhaps one of those two, or perhaps one of the other 180,000 titles uh, available to you as well. Uh, give it a try, audibletrial.com slash goodseats. Thanks for listening and back to our conversation. Okay. 
Okay, so and there's another sort of rumor floating around there, and I don't know where this sort of came about in our conversations in, our, in this podcast, but maybe you could either put this to rest or corroborate it. Um, was there, uh, to your knowledge, um, a, 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 any kind of sort of agreement amongst uh, the league or the league clubs or owners to help subsidize the, this uh, big contract of Pele's beyond what Warner Communications, the owner, was putting together? That, that is sort of a uh, take one for the league kind of thing to help get Pele well, here and share it's, the wealth. So it's quite, it's quite, quite simple. I did a deal with the league that if Pele played in their home game, um, I mean, if he was injured or whatever, it didn't count. But that we would get a percentage of the difference in their regular home gates and their gate for the Pele game. So, you know, if somebody got 10,000 normally and 50,000 for Pele, we'd get, I think it was 15, could have been 10% or 15% of the difference of the gate revenue between their poor crowd and their Pele crowd. That's the help that we got to finance Pele. Interesting. So it wasn't a, a check ahead of time. It was a performance a guarantee or, or percentage uh, of the of the of the time he was uh, with the. Yeah, the, the, the clubs they agreed. You know, here's what we normally get, and here's what we got when you were there, and here's your percentage of it. Quite simple. Uh, at what point, uh, as uh, when Pele sort of brings it, obviously, and, and, you know, a lot of people sort of look back and sort of say, well, it was an immediate, uh, uh, you know, a catalyst to, you know, obviously success in crowds in New York, certainly, and, and the league itself. But it's true. I mean, you look at it, it's almost like a direct line. I mean, uh, the attention and then the curiosity, right? It, it was, it's almost uh, overnight in that respect. At what point, I mean, this is by 76, you're back in Yankee Stadium, so you can accommodate some larger crowds. Uh, and then obviously you're on your way to Giant Stadium, circa '77. Um, but at what point did um, did you and uh, Steve Ross, the Erdogans, uh, the management, uh, overall everybody involved with the team? Um, it feels to me like it was an inflection point of some substance, right? Um, that also begot or begat the notion, the idea that Pele sh- probably the, the beginning of this uh, pursuit of quality talent, not the end of it. There came a a major difference of opinion. Um, I signed Beckenbauer over the objections of some of the owners because I wanted him to be the last foreign player I signed because he was such a complete player on the field that I wanted a whole more and more and more and more young Americans to come on, and I felt that we could do quite well with uh, the number of Americans who were beginning to show talent and Pele there to play in the middle of the field and control everything. But um, the signing then at the urging of uh, Steve Ross, the signing of Kinalia, um, and then somebody else wanted, oh, that's right, the Erdogans wanted a Turkish player. Um, and so we ended up signing Turkish goalkeeper and had a, a <laughs> mass of limousines leading 75 Rockefeller Plaza with ownership and everybody on board uh, going down to the helicopter port and flying by helicopter across the giant stadium to discuss the goalkeeper situation. The Turkish guy or Shep Messing, should he play on this weekend? And we wanted Shep Messing the whole time. And most of the time, Gordon Bradley and I won. <coughs> but um, the owners were getting, because of the success, were getting more and more interested and more and more involved and more and more stupid. Uh, and um, so that was that. So I, I get the sense, reading from some of the Steve Ross biographies and stuff, that uh, ultimately he kind of, and like a lot of owners in various fledgling and or challenger leagues of the time, and we can, it's, it's, it's very historical. He, I, it almost feels like this was his NFL team uh, at, at some point. Um, and perhaps some of the opulence or the big timeness of this was maybe sort of, uh, did you get a sense that this was sort of his uh, dream is really, this is him playing out his desire to be an NFL owner or, or a major 
I guess, professional sports league in the United States owner. And then that perhaps with the signing of Pelé and this sort of growing into something maybe significant, that this was sort of his way of doing that? Or am I, am I, am I putting words in your mouth here? Well, I mean, there's no question that, that he suddenly wanted to be prominent in whatever was happening. I mean, I recall him when we moved to Giant Stadium, um, which he didn't want because there was no subway to Giant Stadium, he said. But when we got to Giant Stadium and it worked, uh, he was full of praise for himself that we'd gone to Giant Stadium. Um, so, you know, I, we had a bunch of owners who sort of were in the background, but suddenly wanted to be in the foreground. And um, it wasn't just uh, Steve Ross, it was the Erdigans, and with Steve Ross's great friend, Canalia, um, and that was it. So maybe maybe some sense of the 77 season, right? Because it's clear that you, you've been uh, helping architect this team from where it, uh, it's, it's very modest beginnings, right? And obviously from the league office itself uh, to, shall we say, the precipice of, I don't know, superstardom, uh, uh, you know, the, the, it's mm-hmm. under, you cannot underestimate. And I, you know, uh, clearly the story of the cosmos has been talked about uh, quite a bit, but I, you know, I think there's a whole generation of fans who just, don't under, you cannot underestimate how uh, comet like uh, this team was in the mid to late 1970s, not just on the New York sports scene, but just, you know, on the, on the, the national Sports and Nash certainly national soccer scene, the international scene, especially in the sport of soccer. Sure, sure. Right? I mean, did you at what point say maybe in '77 when you're there at Giant Stadium, starting to see some of these gigantic crowds? Uh, at what point did you sort of was there any time that you sort of took great great pride of like, wow, look how far we've come, and then maybe at the same time say, wow, where is this gonna go? And maybe not necessarily in a good way, or were you just sort of caught up in the moment? No. Well, as I mentioned just now, I knew where it was going to go if I was making the decisions. It was going to be the first NESL team to have a majority of American talent on the field every game and doing extremely well and helping build a national team. That's what I wanted. But because of the stage we reached, the ownership wanted more and more and more and more stars. As Ahmed, I think it was, said at one time, they wanted the number one player from each country in the world, which was absolutely opposite to what I wanted to do. Um, And, I mean, I remember once somebody saying to me, look, you better pop up and see Nesri because he wants to talk about uh, who to sign for next year. Oh, all right, then. So I went up and I said, oh, these are some of the players. He's a list. Um... Um, of half a dozen players I've been talking to and thinking about. And he looked at the list, didn't say anything. He said, sign him, him, and him. And I looked and I said, well, the only problem with that, Nesri, is all three of them are left backs. Hmm. And we don't exactly need three left backs. So that was another item of of building my total unpopularity with the uh, with the ownership. Um, and their ideas were just, Totally different than mine, and you know, it was my ideas that got us there. But it, my future ideas were absolutely opposed to theirs. So, uh, if I may be so bold, how did it sort of come to an end? I, I this is around seven. This is in the '77 season, I guess, that you essentially left. I I wonder if it was similar yep. to around when Gordon Bradley left the team as well and was replaced. And I mean, it seemed uh, yeah, it seemed kind it, of all was, of a sudden for somebody who followed the team early in '77 to see. Yeah. Right. I, I'm curious it to hear that back. All, all, it's, it was all part of what I just explained, where ownership suddenly wanted to make decisions. Um, I, it was explained to me one day that the ownership was upset that they didn't get enough publicity and enough thanks for what they were doing. Well, you know, they, they weren't exactly there at Randall's Island um, to see what we were doing. Um, so the thing developed to where they wanted to make decisions. They wanted to make decisions about the coaching, about the players, about everything, even though they hadn't got a bloody clue. Um, And um, so they said to me one day, look, you know, we've had enough. And um, so I, uh, I departed. 
Was that it was so was that in the middle of the season? Was this before, you know, the playoffs and the, yeah. the soccer bowl? Before before the playoffs, yeah. Okay. So that must have left you, I don't know, I would say bitter, but uh, certainly um miffed. Uh no? <laughs> Um, well, you know, to talk about them is difficult because there may be women and children listening to this program, so I have to be careful what I say, okay. uh, what words I choose. Um, it was a disgusting way they behaved. Um, they were totally useless in terms of what they wanted to do, um, and their attitude to the people who'd built the, the club, not just me, but you know, Gordon Bradley as well, um, was despicable. Um, and I'm only sorry that they're, they're dead, passed away, because, you know, you shouldn't speak so, such ill of, uh, of dead people. But it's a fact. Those who built the club were dismissed. And, and I, I would assume the feelings of bittersweetness, right, when that gigantic crowd in the playoffs uh, at Giants Stadium, the world's uh, the, the largest in the U.S. at that, at that point, uh, the soccer bowl championship. I mean, look, I mean, that's all your handiwork, right? And um, uh, to not be around yeah. literally yeah. in the midst of it as that's happening, it's got to feel a little sort of sad. And yeah, well, you know, there was another occasion I recall when I was running the Toronto club when we won four one at Giant Stadium against the Cosmos. I remember that very well. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean the. Um, Chicago, we reached um, soccer bowl once, if not yeah, once. Toronto, we meet, reached it twice. So, I mean, after I left the Cosmos, the clubs I was running got that far, and we often beat the Cosmos, and the, the Cosmos were a shambles. But, um, you know, bitter, bitter, you said, miffed. Um, bitterly angry, if I want to think about it, and if I want to give you the right words. So where was uh, where is uh, Phil Woosnam in all of this, right? So you know, obviously you had been. Oh, with well, him. you see, oh, I mean, Phil wasn't there anymore um, because um, uh, one day Nesby was out walking around the street and bumped into a guy he knew, a fellow called Howard Samuels, who had been a failed candidate for a New York governor, I think it was, or New York Senate or something or other, and before you know it. Phil Woosnam, who has contributed greatly to the building of the league, is out, and Howard Samuels is the new president of the league. And he is the guy I referred to earlier. Didn't I don't think he knew the shape of a soccer ball. And um, uh, he was hopeless would be praise. Well, that but that's okay. But that's that's uh, in the the where, that's in the early days. I was I'm really I was curious, sort of where. So Phil it was still very much involved at your time when you were leaving the Cosmos and then going. Yes. To oh, yes. Yes. Right? So I, I guess I was just going to get. I, I guess this is sort of my little uh, attempt at a segue to get into. So it seems to me that maybe obviously the relationship with Phil and you were strong, obviously from the earliest days. But w- you know, I guess when when you were shall we say departing the the Cosmos, what what was Phil's opinion about? that move or or was he now possibly my my interpretation correct me if i'm wrong perhaps getting shall we say caught up in the success of this too not unlike say the cosmos no no phil phil thought it was ridiculous okay um but there was nothing he could do about it and he had he was starting to get lots of problems that hadn't existed before and um you know there's only five minutes before i started getting offers to run other clubs. So, you know, Phil didn't get involved. He didn't ask Phil to get involved, and he couldn't have done anything if he did get involved. How did the sting come about? What uh, Obviously, you would be uh, perceived to be a very uh, hot, I would argue, commodity, given what you had done from the earliest days, building up what was arguably now maybe the most, uh, certainly the glamour club or the beginnings of the glamour club of the, of, uh, of the NASL. Uh, I suspect Lee Stern probably... Uh, uh, saw you from afar, and uh, how did that uh, Chicago Sting relationship uh, come about? For well, seven? I mean, Lee, 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 I knew Lee very quite well because I mean, uh, I was on all kinds of committees, and Lee was, and so we'd met and we'd had arguments and um, whatever. But I, you know, met him scores of times, and he just gave me a call and said, "What about it?" And so that's what happened. 
And what of the sting? Um, very interesting. Uh, Lee is on our, our, our list. We, we've been uh, touching base with his, uh, his folks and uh, hopefully we're going to have him uh, on an episode in the, uh, in the coming weeks. But um, you know, uh, was this, uh, so 7879, was this, were you splitting time between Wrigley Field and Comiskey where you had, you been at Soldier Field? Oh I mean, yeah. That different was, market, right? That was great. That was dreadful when we had to play this two two the um uh playing two stadiums the same season. That was that was awful. Um the uh hiring Willie Roy as a coach was one of the few um good decisions I made in Chicago. He did a good job, recruited some good players. Um but that two stadiums plus then we were because of somebody else in the league, we were going to have indoor soccer as well, or did have indoor soccer. And the Sting were going to play in some beautiful brand new uh, arena. Um, and something went wrong with the arena. It, it fell down or couldn't be used. And so there was another playing problem for the Sting, and I just couldn't stand it. So um, I let Lee uh, carry on and uh, ended up few weeks later, taking the Toronto job, which was a bit easier. But the um, uh, funny thing is that about oh, last year, I got an email from Lee saying that he'd just come across some sting tickets from when I was running the club and that um, they were $1 for kids and $3 for adults. And how did I expect to fill Soldier Field charging such huge, horrendous prices for a sting game. So <laughs> I replied and said, well, um, as you haven't paid, that's what you're fired. So I just replied and said, as you haven't paid me <laughs> since 1979, that's about $30 million you owe me. And so he replied and said, no problem, I'll wire it. As soon as I find out how much of your expenses went on Cuban cigars. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we had a good laugh. Yeah, that. Before we leave uh, the, the Sting, because 79 obviously was a, was a pretty successful season. Uh, it seemed to me that yep. uh, the Sting kind of really became one of the better sides uh, in the league. Yep. And you cannot argue that, uh, you know, this thing certainly, you know, Lee Stern had been in, with that team. Uh, he's probably the longest lasting uh, owners, right? And and to, to what financial detriment, right? But um, it's certainly having now living in Chicago as I do now, uh, it is amazing to me uh, how many people have fond memories, even if they weren't alive at the time of this club. Yeah. Uh, it, it was the logo or people like, you know, coach Willie Roy or Carl Heinz Granitza. Certainly. I, I suspect you were part of that. Um, uh, him coming to that franchise, et cetera. Yeah. Well, that's good. You know, we did a decent job there in a couple of years that I was there and they carried on doing a decent job. So, that's the way it went with several clubs. All right. How does Toronto happen? And and I'm really curious because uh, by 1980, when you joined them as what president, general manager, what, I don't know what the, the official title was, but the, the head honcho, whatever, shows, whatever. <laughs> um, the, Toronto has a very had a, at the time had a very interesting and, and somewhat torturous uh, history with the NASL, right? Because you know when they won the championship in '76, right? They were known as the Toronto Metro's Croatia, um, sure. which I'm sure was the, based on my readings, was something that uh, Phil was in particular not too happy about having sort of that ethnic relationship, yeah. but it was no. kind of a lifeline for that club just to keep it there in the, in the city at that time, which he needed, right? That's right. And um, uh, suddenly out of the blue, I had nothing to do with it, that I can recall, um, out of the blue came these TV people. I shouldn't remember the names, but I don't. Um, who bought the club from um, uh, Croatian owners uh, and um, then gave me a call and said, Oi, you fancy coming to uh, Canada? So um, as they were changing the name to the Blizzard, and you know, I like Toronto, it was a nice place, and they had Cuban cigars there, which they didn't in the United States. Um, so I took that job. And uh, we did quite well. So that was the uh, Global Television Network. So I, there's a picture, and I, I'm trying to uh, remember, it was um, trying to remember uh, some of the players that were featured in the picture. And I don't know if it was the first season as the Blizzard or the second, 
Um, and I don't know if it was, uh, I, I just don't remember. I have to, I'll, I will find it and I will email it to you. Um, but do you remember a game in the early part of one of those first seasons, either 80 or 81, where it was actually snowing? Almost oh, sure. Yeah. Oh, yes, Absol- absolutely. Um, it was, in fact, if my memory is correct, it, it wasn't snowing before the game or in the first half, but when the players came out for the second half, it was pouring down. Yeah, it's 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 a great picture, and I will I will post it uh, when we uh, uh, post this. Uh, yeah, no, I've uh, yeah, oh no, absolutely, it was it was snowing. It was the perfect welcome for the blizzard. That's hilarious. So, all right, so give me a sense then of of the 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 nineteen eighty to nineteen eighty four. You're 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 leading the Toronto Blizzard, and you're still very much involved in the league. So, I guess I have sort of two questions in regard to that. So, one, um, with the New York Cosmos and and all of their shall we say, vaunted success or at least perceived success in your rearview mirror. And having been with with at least one other club and now a second club since then, um, I'm really curious to hear your, what was your perception of the league at that point uh, in, in your Toronto uh, management days? When did you sort of see things go a little, shall we say, wobbly in this well, sort of I, I 2014 yeah. league thing? I can't say what year um, or precisely what, but as the days or months or years passed, um, a lot of unbelievably stupid decisions were made by the league. Um, for example, the league had an executive for years, had an executive committee, which consisted of you know, people like Lamar Hunt and I think Lee Stern and, you know, George Strawbridge in Tampa, sensible people, and, and me. Um, and suddenly all these new people, because we expanded, that was it, we had an expansion. Um, and the expansion brought on a bunch of new people who were the same kind of idiots who ruined us in the first place because they changed this executive committee and each division had to have its person and the people on the executive committee, I think with maybe one exception, were suddenly people who had not had five minutes experience in the league before. And so decisions were made that were totally ridiculous. I mentioned before, mentioned earlier, these idiot um, rock stars who own Philadelphia, uh, who just had no idea what they were doing. They, were, they weren't in Philadelphia. They were just somewhere where they had a team. Um, and, you know, did a dreadful job there. We had a terrible job in Western Canada, Calgary and Edmonton, where the two people out there were one of them ended up in jail. And then the TV people in Toronto um, got a bit, well, then first of all, the, that's right, the, the people in Montreal, which was, oh, the big brewers owned the club and were doing a good job whatever the brewer was, it, was I think called. it was Molson, right? Molson, that's right, yes. And um, they quit because of the idiocy of a decision that Howard Samuels made, and they were so perturbed at the way it was made so casually that uh, they quit. And um, then the TV people quit, and they sold it to a fellow called Karsten von Worsaby, owned a bunch of hotels, um, including the York Hanover in in Toronto, and was a soccer fan, German guy, um, hence York Hanover. York being the old name of Toronto, Hanover being where he came from in Germany. Um, and we were doing okay, but then he got into terrible trouble. Um, business dealings in Bermuda and Germany and all kinds of places, and was, uh, I, I, I'm not sure if he ended up um, prosecuted or not, but it was bad days for him. And at that same time, the the league was finding the stupidity of its expansion um, because some of the expansion guys, like the idiots in Western Canada, were ruining things. And some of the good guys, like I say, Moulton in um, uh, Montreal, decided they didn't want to do business with idiots. Um, stay in business with, with people who are doing everything wrong. 
So the league started to fold, fold to pieces again. And I had forgotten until you raised this subject, there was a meeting, I don't know which year it was now, but it's easy to find out the year in which the league expanded to uh, maybe 22 teams or something like that. Yeah, 70, and, 78, uh, they, 70, uh, 78, they went to uh, 24 teams from, I guess it was 18. 24 teams. Yeah. Okay, that's it. That was the expansion, which some of us were totally against, but we lost the vote and they went to 24 and um, that was the beginning of the end. So why the haste to add six teams in one year? I'm, I'm assuming actually, and I think I've heard this, and maybe it's just one answer of, of a bunch, right? But television and the pursuit of such, right? That sort of having a bigger footprint to attract television versus 18 teams in 77? Well, it may have been also the fact that the new teams were having to cough up money to join franchise fees. There you go. Um, I forget, a few million, and so it was a share. Some people wanted to share. And I do recall, unfortunately, um, the meeting in which the decision was made that Steve Ross turned up for the first league meeting he never attended and spoke vociferously and endlessly about the need to expand and all the rest of it, and that's what happened. I say, and then with the executive committee being changed, the whole uh, and Samuel's eventually coming in whenever it was to take over from Woosnam, uh, there was basically no one left at the decision making level who had the faintest idea what they were talking about. So let, 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 let's un, uh, let me understand a little bit more about, and unfortunately, Phil's no longer with us to hear this. And I, I wish I had had the opportunity in this podcast back when I. Uh, first met him during the uh, 35 year anniversary of the NASL at the old uh, soccer hall of fame in Anianta. Uh, I did get to meet mm-hmm. him, but I uh, would have loved to have asked him this question. I, you know, in your, from your perception, right, you're obviously very, very much involved in not only the Toronto team, but still the league operations. Um, maybe a little bit of under, uh, you sort of give a little bit of background, but sort of what, what were the, maybe the events or the the situation that sort of led to Phil's ouster and the replacement with uh with this admittedly non-soccer guy. Um, did anything in particular precipitate it besides sort of the bigger issues? And and when did it sort of happen and, and maybe why at that point? Was it 81, 82? I forget. You know, I honestly don't remember the specific happenings or the specific reasons. Um, it was all part and parcel, I would say, of what had been going on that those new to the whole thing were now making the decisions and those who had brought the league and the game to that level were not wanted anymore. And it was commonplace. Well, but with that though, the soul of the entire league, right? And, you know, you, you arguably you're, you're, you were a microcosm of that back in 77 when you left the cosmos, right? It's sort of, you know, you're responsible for, for basically bringing the team to, uh, that level of success and then potentially what it goes sure. to further, right? Uh, Phil, it's, this is probably even a, you know, a, a grander vision of that, right? Because without obviously a, a Phil Woosnam in the darkest days of this league back way back when, you wouldn't even be at this shall, arguably higher order problem of too many franchises and national television issues and, and that um, kind of stuff. I, I just I just came across um, some old pieces of paper a while ago. Um, back from 1969, when Phil and I were, as I said before, in the league office, um, both of which I wrote. Um, one was, this. Uh, so I wrote it because in one case I was the chairman of the publicity committee of the Federation. We didn't have a committee, but I was chairman of it. And we had a meeting, Phil and Gene Edwards and whoever else was around at the time. And we decided that we were, you know, Phil and I pushed for it and everyone agreed we would fight over the years to get the World Cup. So that was written in 1969. Same year, um, I ended up writing with input from Phil and other people, um, the long range plan for the league, what we would do is several pages long, um, how we would develop the game and do this and do this and do this and do this. So much 
of the time that Phil and I were there, we were discussing things with owners like Lamar Hunt and Bob Herman, a few others, who had gone through that ridiculous early stage in some respects. And we were talking utter nonsense as to what we were going to do in the future. Um, and so there was that clear, relatively clear plan as to where we were going to go until the expansion. Um, and in fact, those who voted for the expansion, that's right. I remember, no, we wanted to kick some of them out of the league. But instead of that, they voted for the expansion. And so that was uh, helping the thing on its way. But um, both, you know, in, in my opinion, um, the, uh, the advance from nothing to something fairly important uh, came about because of the plans that we had at the beginning and the support there was from a bunch of good owners. And then the whole thing almost failed to begin with and flopped at the end was because of idiot owners. And I exclude from that people like Strawbridge and Stern and 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 Bob Herman and Lamar Hunt and Walt Daggett um, and some of the others whose names escape me now. But there were a bunch of you know very good people made always have differences of agreement, but they were genuine people wanted to do a genuine thing in their cities. But some rubbish. So. Uh... Speak to me about um, about Howard Samuels and sort of the last days of the league, because obviously, yeah, I, I want to get a sense of sort of you mentioned, you know, his uh, uh, enormous uh, unqualifications, I guess, for uh, being a, a soccer league uh, commissioner and then some. Um, but maybe a little bit of but it's also I think it my understanding it gives me it sort of seems like a a very um, descriptive coda, perhaps of the league itself in its last year and days, right? Because at the end of everything, who did they turn to once uh, Howard uh, uh, died uh, somewhat uh, uh, unexpectedly? Um, it was you right? pretty much to kind of, you know, pick up the pieces and see what was left if yeah. anything to go forward. So well, the I, league, the league, the league was already dead. Um, I mean, I had the league, the Colton was ownership had been passed to, to Canalia and he was, uh, we had a you know league meeting with the lawyers at present and all the rest of it. And did, went through the formalities to kick the Cosmos out of the league. Uh, and the meeting in which Canalia threatened to throw the league attorney out the window. Um, prior to that, I had been in Vancouver just about convincing someone to come into the league in Vancouver. Uh, when a guy came in the, the room we were having the meeting in and said, hey, look at this. And there was a uh, AP or Reuters or whatever story um, that uh, the, the Cosmos were going to play by themselves and do all kinds of things and weren't sure they were going to play in the league. And so the Vancouver people said, oh, well, in that case, thanks for coming to see us. But, you know, we don't want to talk about this anymore. So the, the thing was, and that, oh, that's sort of another fellow from Houston was going to come in and put a... Um, uh, the Houston franchise in, and then, well, he didn't like the stadium, so then he went to uh, somewhere in Georgia or Mississippi or somewhere it was going to have a stadium, but then it didn't happen. So all this kind of stuff was was happening to, to close the down. And it was not dissimilar to that mentality of ownership which almost finished the thing off back in the, uh, in the 70s. So you were you were uh, with the Blizzard eighty four. You came that close to winning the championship in eighty four. The now three game series called the Soccer Bowl against Chicago, your old uh, That's right. nemesis. Um, and Samuels basically by the end of the season, just shortly thereafter, dies of a I think it was a heart attack. Right? Um, what, what do you what had he not you know passed? What um, did you did you have any positive sense? Uh, at that time that maybe things could be turned around uh, in the league? Or did you think that even with his passing or perhaps exacerbated by it, that it was just sort of inevitable even before that happened? That it was not Two things I would say. First of all, just one story about Howard Samuels. He came to Toronto when I was in Toronto. And we had a big meeting, the mayor of Toronto and all the people on that wonderful great tall tower they've got there 
forget what it's called now. Um, so we got this 50, oh, maybe 100 people, and Howard Samuels made the speech. Um, I think it may have been about soccer ball or something, whatever. It was to promote us. Um, and um, at the end, as his voice raised, he said, and one day the United States will win the World Cup, which, of course, was not met with tumultuous applause in Canada, but complete silence. I mean, you know, what a... Yeah, not a great read. Of, not a great read of the room, right? I mean, just awful. People were looking around, saying, "Who's this stupid idiot?" You know, if he doesn't know what bloody country he's in. Um, so I mean, it, it, it was just it was reported widely that uh, he uh, told everyone in Canada that the United States was going to win the World Cup one day. That did did a lot of good. Um, and your your question about had I did I have a feeling things were going undoubtedly, um, and it, it in fact it had started um, when that expansion took place and the changes in in the executive committee members and all the rest of it. It was for those who, who had what I would say common sense. Um, we were all concerned. Uh, and I mentioned a bunch of owners just now who were good. I mean, and they had their concerns. <coughs> but now they were in a minority, a minority vote, and things were not going well. All right. Well, a couple of things as we sort of, uh, uh, I guess, sort of uh, round the corner here and, and get out of the NASL. So uh, one thing that, that, that the league certainly, uh, and that you were certainly uh, uh part of, of course, was sort of the approach to the on-field play, right? So the the rules, right? The experimentation, the 35-yard line, the shootout, the three North Americans on the field at all times, um, the points system. Um, you know, in retrospect, these things look like not only part of the vanguard, but frankly, prescient, uh, given sort of the sometimes morbid state of the game and, and frankly, how some of those rules have changed since the 70s and early 80s. Um, maybe a bit of sense of your role in and or others' roles in uh, the approach to, shall we say, challenging conventions with rules a bit for the uh, American marketplace with the NASL. I would say much of a credit for that would go to Phil Woosnam. Um, I don't recall anybody else come up with those ideas. Um, the idea of playing a guaranteeing a certain number of Americans on the field of all times, I recall personally being very strongly in favor of that. As I said, it's one of the reasons I signed Beckenbauer so that he would be on the field controlling, I hoped, a bunch of American kids. Um, but Phil was, you know, and, and names of players on the back of the shirt and that kind of stuff. That was all, I think, all Phil's ideas. You think though the rules though that that was helpful though I I look at the point system and and you, you'd think maybe today that some of the games, uh, in some of the international leagues could benefit from thirty five yard line it, probably a bit more controversial right you can make the argument there but but the point system where you're rewarding some attacking soccer play it seems like that was a, you know a good a good thing that helped make the sport a little bit more shall we say dynamic perhaps for the uh, mm -hmm. unwashed American mm -hmm. audiences. Yeah, sure. I mean, it didn't hurt at all. All right. Uh, I guess sort of the last real, I guess, big question would be, um, let's call it sort of the, I guess, the legacy, right? So, you know, there a lot of people look back at the NASL and say, you know, certainly was sort of that sort of once in a lifetime kind of thing. It's never going to be replicated. MLS is more sane approach to life. But frankly, I think there's a lot more people who would sort of say, you know, without the NASL, there wouldn't be whatever there is today, Major League Soccer, a, a potentially competitive U.S. national team. Um, uh, the World Cup, you know, we didn't even talk about that. Maybe we could just maybe start there and then go to your sort of uh, your your legacy you sort know, of answer. With, with, without the NASL, yep. one thing that wouldn't be taking place for sure is this conversation. <laughs> and another thing that wouldn't be taking place is your conversation with anybody else about the game of soccer. The NESL did it. And I don't mean to say I did it or Phil Woosnam did it. 
the NESL with its collective work, some of it good, some of it brilliant, some of it not so good, some of it terrible, changed the entire picture from literally when we started, people would say, oh, soccer, what soccer? Oh, is, what's that like? Kickball, is it? Is, oh, 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 you play? No, I didn't know that. Didn't, and what's the World Cup? And what's a national team? And, you know, why are you doing this? Do, do they play this anywhere else? I mean, we, we were communist midgets, according to a newspaper, in I think it was in San Francisco, um, intruding into the American game. Uh, in, in Baltimore, I remember being asked by... Um, uh, oh, forget his name now, um, with the, one of the big Baltimore newspapers, when we reached the championship game in 67, um, playing Oakland in the final, uh, he said, so if you beat Oakland, you'll be world champions, right? So I said, well, no, because there are so many other countries where soccer is played, and we would only be champions of this league. Not like a team in the NFL is world champion, or Major League Baseball is world champion or the NBA is world champion because nobody else plays those bloody games. Um, but everyone plays our game, and so we won't be world champions. I mean, that was the kind of mentality that, that existed. Um, so <clears throat> it, it was from almost zero. I said the only place the game existed then was in little narrow ethnic groups in various cities, it existed in St. Louis, um, it existed in, in Annapolis. The uh, Naval Academy in Annapolis had a soccer team, and Glenn Warner, their coach, was was known because he was the only soccer coach in, in Maryland. I mean, it was nothing um, around. So if it hadn't been for the NSL, there'd still be nothing around. Well, now, that's uh, certainly an interesting set of, uh, of chatter and conversation, don't you think? Uh, not uh, one to mince words and uh, certainly a, a, a legendary career in the building and the shaping of the professional soccer game in this country with, uh, with Clive Toy, who we thank tremendously uh, for being a guest. And, of course, uh, if you want to uh, go deeper into uh, some of the things that we proverbially just scratched the surface on, the book you need to get. Is called A Kick in the Grass, The Slow Rise and Quick Demise of the NASL. Uh, came out in 2006. It's published by our friends at St. Johann Press. Uh, and believe me when I say in this 170, almost 180 pages or so, uh, is just it's chock full of stuff. It's chock full of great stories, anecdotes, uh, some uh, eyebrow raising tales, uh, a number of uh, very interesting and uh, hard to find, if not impossible to uh, to find uh, pho- photography and uh, and and uh, knickknacks and things from the uh, from the career of Clive Toy during the North American Soccer League, and I highly recommend it. Uh, you should also check out Clive's other books, Anywhere in the World, which came out in 2015, also in St. Johann Press, uh, which is uh, a look into the uh, international uh, lens, if you will, of the game and where it is today and kind of how it got there. And uh, for you kids out there, uh, Toby and the Greatest Game, which uh, is published by iUniverse, uh, is also out there. We're going to have links to all of those books on our website which I uh, highly encourage you to check out, of course, at goodseatsstillavailable.com. Uh, our interview with Clive Toy, and you will see links to all those books, uh, as well as some other cool stuff, a little bit of description of the show and uh, some uh, some links to some cool stuff uh, related to uh, what Clive and I uh, just got finished talking about. We also want to remind you that we are active, uh, and then some, on uh, social media. Feel free to follow us there, too, will you? On uh, Twitter, you'll find us at Good Seats Still. Uh, on uh, Instagram, you'll find us at Good Seats Still Available. You can like us on Facebook. Uh, and uh, if you want to send us some email, by all means, do that. We're at uh, hello at goodseatsstillavailable.com. And uh, again, if you go to the website, you'll also be able to sign up for our uh, weekly newsletter uh, and find out all kinds of other good stuff, see our old episodes, etc. cetera. So uh, by all means, do that. And once again, we, of course, uh, we could not do this without the... Uh, uh, the good work and uh, the kind graces of our friend Jerry Payne and uh, his friends at Podfly Productions. That's podfly.net. 
get your podcasting needs served there, will you? And uh, we thank them and him, as always, for uh, the great production work that, that he and they do. All right, I'm done. Thank you so much for listening. It's been a pleasure, uh, and I appreciate your listening, and hopefully we'll hear you or see you or talk to you again in the very near future. Take care, everybody. 